close this part with so you can feel free to do whatever you need to. They talked about it. it took 10 years to develop, 10 years to do. Now they're going to redo it. Let me just give you a little list of the development of the King James Version in terms of trying to refine all the mistakes, all the misspellings, all the wrong words. Here's a King James. 1611. King James. 1612. A refinement. 1613. 400 corrections, 1629, more revision. Because when they first did it, there was writing, there was sometimes misspelled words, there was sometimes periods in the wrong place, there was all kinds of stuff. There was another one in 1631, 38, 68, 1717, 1744, 1745, 1762, 1769, 1782. None of these changed the literal equivalents. They only improved the quality of the text. None of these went from literal to dynamic. None of these did what I just gave you an example has been done. 1799, Oxford. 1800, Macklin. 1813, and published Philadelphia. 1837, 1840, London edition. 1842, Philadelphia. 1846, American Bible. 1852, revised. 1873, Scribner, which strong concordance says is the best modern edition of the King James Version. 1877 is Gurney, the editor. 1911, Tercentenary commemoration edition. 1988 edition. There is no translation in the world that has been as inspected, scrutinized, refined, re-refined, checked, examined, and re-examined for as long or as intensely or as many times as the King James Version. None. So, that's the end of the lesson on dynamic and literal equivalence. Um, any questions? My time's up, so you and I will have to do it over time. Now, look, I, pr I promise you, I'm not kidding. If you want to leave, leave. Please leave. I don't care. I mean, you, some of you got stuff to do. You come here to see family. You're going to have lunch together. I understand all that. Uh, but if there's two of us left, we're going to go through the next part of this. Why don't you stand up for a minute, and, 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 and if that creates a temptation to go, go. Uh, stretch, raise your hands, shake somebody's hand, greet each other a little bit. If you tell me not to do this, I won't. Both of you are my elders. You're really my elders. Much older. All right. Some of you don't forget your home. Howard Stern's on the radio, and he don't worry about whether you're listening or not. Some of you don't know what organization Howard Stern belongs to. So. All right. I'm, I'm serious. You got to go? Here. We're going back to old-time Pentecost. We're going to go till people fall out the window and kill themselves. Am I messing up anything that's supposed to be happening in here, Brother Odom? Nothing else is happening in here? Some folks think nothing's happening in here. All right. We won't go that long. All right. Uh, the second part of this is about manuscripts. Antiochian manuscripts versus Alexandrian manuscripts. You may be seated. Um, there are two issues in how Bibles are being translated. Two issues. Primary. One issue is the issue of literal and dynamic equivalency. Prior to 1950, there wasn't any, very little, dynamic equivalency. The second issue, though, is just as important as the first. And I wasn't even going to teach the second one. I thought, but there's people who want to know... And how are we going to do it if we don't just do it? The second issue is about manuscripts. Important statement. Before 1881,
virtually all manuscripts, few exceptions, were exclusively literal translations of Antiochian manuscripts. Now, there's other terms for Antiochian. Probably the most popular, I use it because it gives the two cities. It's easy to remember. Antiochian manuscripts derive out of Antioch. Alexandrian manuscripts derive out of Alexandria, Egypt. But Al Antiochian manuscripts are usually called Byzantine manuscripts because they come from that area, which is where Antioch is, or Byzantine Antiochian manuscripts. But we'll, we'll just use Antiochian so that we don't have to say those big words every time we come to that bridge. Okay? Everybody understand that? Say amen. amen. Okay. However, beginning in 1881, with two British Bible scholars, church people, Church of England, one named Westcott and one named Hort, H-O-R-T, they used another set of manuscripts that was not available in 1611. In fact, in 1611, one of them they didn't know about at all, and the other they probably only heard of but never had seen. In 1881, Westcott and Hort looked at these manuscripts that had been discovered, and they said, these are better manuscripts than were the Antiochian manuscripts from which we get the King James Version of the Bible. These are better manuscripts. And they set about to prove it. In fact, they did everything they could, especially Hort, to disparage the Antiochian manuscripts from which we get the King James Version. Hort used words, and I'm quoting, like, the Antiochian manuscripts are vile. The Antiochian manuscripts are villainous. And many other words. To downplay the dependability, the veracity of the Antiochian manuscripts. Now, let me just stop long enough to say, nobody has, most of you know this, but we want to get on the same page. Nobody has the original autographs of the Bible. The one that John wrote with his hand, or Paul, or one of his amuenses wrote, or whatever. Not, whatever. These manuscripts are Greek copies of that, that go way back, some within 30 to 50 years of the times of the apostles. We have those. They are in libraries, some of them right here in America. They, they exist. They have been found. We have those manuscripts that go back. Then from those manuscripts, we've seen others copied. We also have thousands of scriptures that are quoted by early, what were called church fathers, who quoted scriptures that lived within 100 years of the times of the apostles. And so all of those quotes are like way back there. And therefore, because these people already were very conscious of being careful, are considered to be very trustworthy. So you take all of those, and then you take all the manuscripts that have been recopied down through time. Of the Antiochian manuscripts, there have been copied in Greek 5,000. We have 5,000 versions that come from 100 A.D. all the way up to 12, 13, 1400 A.D. Copies. Everybody understand that? I'm, I'm just trying to define what a manuscript is. Then there's the Alexandrian manuscripts that we'll talk about just in a moment. Okay, so so these manuscripts were used, these Antiochian manuscripts were used by Erasmus, and I already explained to you how the, the six he used matched up with the others, which is pretty telling on its own that these six matched up. I mean, it was like virtually identical. And then it goes through Tyndale, and there were a number of Bibles before the King James, all off of the Antiochian manuscripts. There was the Tyndale, there was the Great Bible, there was the Geneva Bible, there was uh, so forth. And, and those were all part of what was used by the King James translators to translate the King James Version in 16, 
11. Well, at that time, that was the manuscript. However, lying in the Vatican was a copy of an Alexandrian manuscript that's called Codex Vaticanus because it was in, laying in the Vatican. It was discovered in the 1500s that it had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then it was redis, then it was kind of like forgot about again, and it was rediscovered in the 1800s. About the same time as that rediscovery, a man named Tischendorf was traveling and was at Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai. This is in 1840, along in there. 1844 to be exact. And he's, there's a monastery at the base of Mount Sinai. Monasteries will let people stay there free and feed them for three days or seven days or whatever the rule was. Tischendorf stopped there. I don't know what he was. I don't know if he's Catholic or not, but he stopped it. While he was there, there were people that were, they had fireplaces for heat, and he looked in the Kinlan barrel, and they were using sheets of an old copy manuscript of the Bible. He looked at it, he was a scholar, and he recognized that they were burning a very, very ancient copy or jumble of copies, manuscripts that were very old. And so over a period of time between 1844 and 1859, he talked them into letting him copy all of these or have some of them until he got together these manuscripts, which were referred to as Tischendorf, the man that found them. And those manuscripts, along with the Vatican, Vaticanus manuscript, both were Alexandrian manuscripts and are the two main sources. There's one more from 450 AD called the Alexandrinus manuscript. But those are the three sources from which they uh, translated another version of the Bible. You follow all that? Okay. They used the Alexandrian manuscripts. The King James used the Antiochian manuscripts. Westcott and Hort made such an issue that the Alexandrian were older, that the Alexandrian were superior to those utilized by the King James Version, even though they only had 45 manuscripts compared to 5,000, uh, they adamantly insisted that the Alexandrian were superior and more trustworthy. And the reason they did is, number one, they said they were older. And older manuscripts are closer to the originals in age. Therefore, we would assume that they were better. That was one reason. That assumption is not necessarily correct. Because if I would give you the first version of the notes I'm teaching from, they would be older than this version, but they wouldn't be as good as this version because this version refined out stuff that would just take up your time unnecessarily. Okay, so older is not always better. Sometimes it is. The second reason they determined that the Alexandrian were better, and it's important to know this because this is stuff that is used against the King James Version, is that the older the Alexandrian were written with greater economy. In other words, the writing was leaner and Textual critics have determined that the older manuscript gets, the more bloated it gets with words and explanatory stuff because, because each copyist feels necessary to add a little bit to explain this and add a little bit to explain it until it gets wordier, wordier. And therefore, because it was leaner, had less words, uh, no notations, they said that the Alexandrian is better. And sometimes that's true, but not always. Our answer to that would be that the original was written in Koine Greek, which is common Greek, the Greek of the people. The Alexandrian was written in formal Greek, official Greek. The Antiochian was written in Koine Greek. Don't let me lose you. The common people's Greek. The common people's Greek was more wordy than the Alexandrian formal Greek. Therefore, the wordiness may not be additions at all. It may be because, and would be, because it's written from original documents that were common Greek, which was 
more wordy than the official document. So all I'm doing with those two examples is showing you that there, there's answers to what Westcott and Hort that are valid answers. A third argument they used was the Alexandrian manuscripts they found were, they found a couple more copies, and they were like, brand new! And they said, that's because they were treasured as being the best documents, and so they were kept apart from everything else. Well, the opposite to that would be the one that was the best is the one they gave to the people. That's why they were worn out. Why would you use something that wasn't the best if you've got the best in a shelf? And so all of those are just arbitrary arguments that are used by thinking people, but doesn't mean. Nevertheless, this is important, the Alexandrian became overwhelmingly the basis for nearly all translations since 1881. Almost every one of them, ASV, RSV, RV, all of these come from um, the Alexandrian manuscripts. So, they said these are the most perfect manuscripts there's ever been, but Tischendorf didn't say that. When he discovered them, he, he said, he looked at all of them. He said there are hundreds of changes and corruptions in these Sinaiticus manuscripts. He said these are, these are not perfect. But Hort overlooked all that. Westcott overlooked all of that. And they said the school of Antioch carelessly translated the text of Scripture in the 2nd century A.D. They did it carelessly because they supposed that the Texas Receptus uh, was... That's, that's where it came from, was this careless translation. Uh, I, I want to give you one more example of this. Again, I want to say, I'm very conscious of time. If you want to go, go. That's fine. Don't care. Uh, Hort said that in the second century, the, the Antiochian manuscripts, which are the ones that our Bible comes from, went through a, quote-unquote, recension by a man named Lucius, who was over the Bible school at Antioch, which is true. You can find Lucius in history. But he said, Lucius did a recension, and he named it the Lucius recension, or the Lucian recension in which he said, he took all of those Antiochian manuscripts and he carelessly translated them. That's the one you guys are using for the King James Version. Now let me tell you, you can take this to the bank. There's not one historical document that says there ever was a Lucian recension. Not one. That was a creation of Hort's mind based on looking at stuff and coming to the conclusion in his mind, that this was true. I'm, I'm just trying to be, I'm not, I'm not trying to be biased, but I am trying to be honest about this. And even in their day, there was a guy named Bergon uh, who said their theory is, and I'm quoting, superstitious veneration for a few ancient documents. And one of the greatest respected scholars was Scrivener, and Scrivener said, Dr. Hort's system is entirely destitute of historical foundation. He does not so much as make a show of pretending to it, but then he would persuade us as he has persuaded himself. Now, I'm going to contend to you, and it's going to take a minute to prove it, to my satisfaction at least, that the Antiochian documents are better than the Alexandrian documents. Because if they are, then obviously we ought to be with the King James and with those that are Antiochian. So... What happened is, is Westcott and Hort's work in 1881 was picked up. You've heard of the Nestle Alain version, which is kind of accepted among scholars as the best Greek version. You've heard of the United Bible Society version. They are both based on the same theories of Westcott and Hort and are very little different than Westcott and Hort, which means they are Alexandrian manuscripts. This is a big debate right now. Not among us because we just shout and run the aisles, but it's a big debate among people everywhere that call themselves Christians big debate. And so people attacked the translators of the King James Version. They weren't Christians. People attacked Westcott and Hort. They weren't Christians. Um, uh, however, let me just talk for a moment about the King James Version that came from the Antiochian manuscripts. We're going to look at the historical evidences briefly, but the Bible source from which the KJV derived that we have was used and trusted in Europe and beyond Europe for 2,000 years. We're not introducing some Johnny-come-lately thing. It's the Bible of the Albigenses. 
It's the Bible of the Waldenses, the Bible you and I use. It's the Bible of the Petrobrusians. It's the Bible of the Arnolists. It's the Bible of the Henricians. This is all groups through history. It's the Bible of the Paulicians. It's the Bible of the Greek Orthodox Church. It's the Bible of the Anglican Church. It's the Bible of the Methodists. It's the Bible of the Anabat, Anabaptists, of which there were tens of thousands of them baptized in Jesus' name. It's the Bible of the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Reformers and the Reformed. It's the Bible that was brought over here by the Puritans, Antiochian manuscripts. It's the Bible that our pilgrims had. It's the Bible that the Quakers used. It's the Bible that the Shakers used. It's the Bible that the Baptists used. It's the Bible that the Pentecostal, uh, Pentecostals used. To believe that the ideas of Westcott and Hort to believe that those are right, you've got to conclude that all of these, John Wesley and everybody else, that transformed the world, did it with a vile, villainous, corrupted text. While all the while, the Roman Catholic Church had the Vaticanus and uh, out, uh, Sinaiticus out in the desert. While they, while that was, they possessed the unadulterated Word of God, we're all following this over here. Another consideration is that there were three main cities in the Roman Empire during this time. One was Rome, one was Alexandria, the third was Antioch. Those were the three main cities in the Roman world. So, it seems like pretty important to me for us to look at what the Bible says. What, what clues the Bible gives us as to which manuscripts are the best. Okay? Uh, I had these for the deal, but somehow they didn't get on the screen. I'm reading from Acts. Please don't turn it. Just take too long. Antioch is mentioned 18 times in the New Testament, and it's mentioned 16 times in the book of Acts. I am attempting to prove that the Antioch and manuscripts are the ones we ought to be following, which means that all of the translations since 1881, virtually all of the new ones, are translations that are not trustworthy as being the Word of God. Amen. Commentary, yes. Word of God, no. They would contain part of the Word of God. They may contain a great part of the Word of God, but they're not as trustworthy as the Antioch. Acts 11.27. This is to show you how the New Testament church migrated to Antioch, which you already know, but let's read these. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. In these days came prophets, uh, that prophets came from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Not Alexandria. 11.19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution, listen to this closely, traveled as far as Antioch, preaching the word. Antioch was not preaching Alexandrian word. Antioch was preaching Jerusalem Antiochian word. Preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. But if you look at 1530, the apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch. Amen. 13 and 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. We're talking about people that's qualified to write scripture or make the very first manuscripts. Listen to this closely. 1349 of Acts. And the word of God was published throughout all the region. If the Word of God was published throughout all the region, then that's manuscripts were coming out of Antioch. This is from the very earliest. This is from the New Testament itself. What other kind of documentation do we need to go back to this? Look at, night, look at 1535. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the Word of the Lord with many others also. We're talking about the people that wrote the Bible. Paul. Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord at Antioch with many others also. Amen. You can't get any more foundational than that. 19 and 10. So that all they which dwelt in Asia, Byzantine, heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Heard the word. Both Jews and Greeks. 19 and 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. All of that is coming out of Antioch. I'm giving you Bible evidence. Whatever. We can, we'll talk about, we can talk about history just like anybody else can. But I'm talking about where the Bible doesn't just indicate, where it reemphasizes over and over that the Word of God had its initial explosion of prevailing and growing and becoming. It had all of that coming and spreading and multiplying out of Antioch. 
In fact, Alexander is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. One time is Apollos came from there to Ephesus, moved out of there. Another two times it simply is talking about a ship that came from Alexandria. It has nothing to do with our subject today. Alexandria doesn't talk about any apostles there, any prophets being from there, any of the apostles being visiting there. None of it. But Antioch is full of it. Doesn't that seem to you, if you're a Bible believer, to be pretty important evidence that the Antiochian manuscript should have validity? Just trying to make this point. All right. Now, to give them their due, when Westcott and Hort looked at those manuscripts and said, these are better, we don't agree. There was people then that don't agree. However, were they? And since 1881, has there been any evidence come up that would prove whether they were more right or less right? And I would say there is new evidence because there's been a lot of archaeological discoveries since the time of Westcott and Hort, which helps to validate or invalidate their conclusions that the Alexandrian manuscripts were better. These recent discoveries include, the, I won't go into all this, but the Charles Beatty papyri, or papyri, which comes from anywhere from 125 A.D., which is about 30 years after John was alive, to 175, right in that area. And they agree with the Antiochian manuscripts. Okay? Then there is evidence, without even going that far, in the Bodmer papers. And then there is the Dead Sea Scrolls, which has shed dramatic new light on manuscripts, their age, their reliability. The manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, as you know, in the 1940s, 1945. They were not available to Westcott and Hort. And so when we look at these manuscripts, let me give you an example. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls contains every book of the Old Testament, uh, pieces of every book of the Old Testament, except the book of Esther. And it contains almost the entirety of the book of Isaiah. Now, listen closely. The book of Isaiah that we have comes out of an Antiochian manuscript in 950 A.D. That's the book of Isaiah you and I have in our King James Version. So, for hundreds of years, people have said, how do you know it's right? It's a 950. It's a late. Hey, how, how can you tell? How do you know? Well, all we could say before is, well, we believe it. It connects with the other Antiochian manuscripts. Uh, do our best. But, in the Dead Sea Scrolls is a copy of Isaiah that comes from about 165 B.C. It's over a thousand years older than the 950 A.D. copy that my and your Isaac, uh, I mean Isaiah, book came from. So they took them and laid them beside one another. And they are so comparable that it validated. Like I got kids that got the Holy Ghost in our church and their parents are kind of half-educated people. And they say, how do you even know the Bible's true? It's been through thousands of hands. It's been through thousands of manuscripts. Well, sis, this is one of the ways we know it's true. I always think of this certain person when I get on this subject. This is one of the ways we know because we now have a copy that's 165 A.D. We have a copy that was 950, and we have a copy that's 2011. And all of them right down the line validate that they are authentic and are, in fact, the Isaiah that's found in the Old Testament originally. And we can't... Get a couple more of these ready. <sighs> I don't ever intend to do this again, but I made up my mind this one time. We're going to go through this until everybody has at least a semi-comprehensive picture of it. Okay? So, now... What we come down to is the Alexandrian manuscripts leave out. They don't have any of these. By, none of these verses are in an Alexandrian manuscript. That's, that's, that's why many of these verses are not in the NIV. 
Many of these verses are not in the ESV. There's a lot of us that have concluded, well, the next heir apparent to the King James Version is ESV. Well, okay, if you don't want Matthew 12:47 in your Bible, that's fine, or 17:21, or 18:11, or 23:14, or Mark 9:44, or 46, or 11:26, or 15:28, or John 5:4, or John 16:9 through 20, or Luke 23:24, or 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 John 7:53, or John 8:11. If you don't want any of those in your Bible, then then you can have the NIV, or you can have the ESV, or you can have because those have all been taken out. Some 33 verses, 577 words, 2.6% of the New Testament is gone. If that's what you want, then have at it. But I would choose to believe that the Antiochian manuscripts, number one, are older. And that's the last thing I'm going to try to prove today before you go slap to sleep. That the Antiochian manuscripts are older, therefore more reliable. Therefore, is there at any point that those scriptures like Revelation that says, he that takes away from this word, the curse will come upon him, or he that adds to this word. Is there anywhere that we even ought to think about that scripture in this discussion? Two of the biggest examples that they use that, and you've read this, you've all read this. I read it when I was a boy and just accepted it. Two biggest examples of what is found in the Byzantine but not found in the Alexandrian, is Mark 16, 9 through 20, which is important to Pentecostals because it talks about you'll speak in other tongues, you cast out devils, you take up servants. You... And so they say that's not in there. Now, the ESV and the NIV did include those two, but they, don't, they didn't want to. And the original NIV said these were not included. They spaced it apart and said these were not included in the original. Well, what they mean is the original Alexandrian. When they say the original Greek, they're talking about the original Alexander, and they're not talking about the original Antiochian. I'm not kidding, folks. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just telling you the truth. So, you read repeatedly of that Mark passage, not found in the oldest manuscripts. Well, let's look. Mark 16, 9 through 20 is missing. It's missing in Eusebius in 360 A.D. It's missing in Clement of Alexandria in 193 A.D. It's missing in Origen in 225 A.D. and his Hexapla. It's missing in it's missing in Jerome in 407 A.D. and the Sinaiticus that Tischendorf found and the Vaticanus do not have it, but they do have a blank space. They knew that it was there somewhere. This is what it is in, though, that they don't tell you. It is in the writings of Irenaeus in 170 A.D. It is in the writings of Polycarp, who was the personal disciple of John in 110 to 155 A.D. It is in the writing of Tatian's Desatessaron, or Dia Tessaron, in 170 A.D. It is in Tertullian in 2 A.D. It is in the Didache in 120 A.D. It is in the Byzantine text families of 700 A.D. It is in the Freer Gospels of 500 A.D. It's in the Codex Bizet of the 400 A.D. It is in the later Alexandrian manuscripts and the Alexandrinus of 450 A.D. It's in the Ephraimi Rescriptus of 400 A.D. It's in the Boharic Coptic in the 3rd century. It's in the Sahidi Coptic in the 3rd century. It's in more old manuscripts than it's not in old manuscripts. And it's in all of the old Antiochian manuscripts, which I just read where the Bible came from. And the same is true, the same is true of the, uh, of the passage in John. We won't go through it, but it, but the same is true. Now, in closing, you say, okay, give us an example of present-day translations that derive from Alexandrian. Okay, let me give you an example. Westcott and Hort produced the Bible in 1881 out of the Alexandrian manuscripts and called it the Revised Version. The Revised Version, they made a deal that for 14 years, that was in England, they made a deal that for 14 years they could not reproduce that in America with an American version. After 14 years, in 1901, by the time they got it done, it was 20 years, they produced the ASV, the American Standard Version. The American Standard Version was revised 
into another standard version in 1937. They were going to do it in 1933, but the Great Depression hit. It took them to 1937. That became the revised standard version of 1951, which the World Council of Churches adopted as the best translation of the Bible in the world. In 1951, it was revised again. Or 1952, it was revised again in 1971. Then it came out twice in the last 12 years or so. One came out as the new... English version, no, yeah, that came out, but that didn't gain as much popular uh, popularity as the English Standard version. And somehow amongst us, the English Standard version has come to be, we feel like people just assume that it is the King James, but it's not. I mean, I'm not trying to hurt people. I'm just telling you it's not. The English Standard Version is, it is a literal translation, because Westcart and Hort translated literally. All of those that I just named are literal translations, but they're Alexandrian literal translations, which leave these verses out of the Bible and change many of the words. My guess is that when I used stronghold earlier as opposed to high tower, I didn't look this up, but my guess is stronghold is probably what the Alexandrian said. I don't know that. I'm just giving you an example. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? So, so when it's all said and done, this is me. I don't want an Alexandrian manuscript Bible. I don't care what you call it. I want an Antiochian manuscript Bible. And the King James derives out of that. I already showed you how many times the King James has been worked over. Brother, the thing's been like cube steak beat with the side of a woman's plate. I mean, every that could be beat out of it. I mean, it just been beat to death to make it as refined and perfect as it can be. And here's the danger I see. Pretty soon people are, it's already getting this way. Where, 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 is there a Bible? Do we even have a Bible? Or is it just a bunch of flopping manuscripts out there somewhere? And I propose to you, we do have a Bible. And the one we had originally is a good Bible. You say, well, we need to take the these and thous out. That's exactly what the ESV and the NIV and some of the others try to do. But the, the, because King James was antiquated. Do you know that thee and thou and ye were not even used at the time of the King James? That that stuff, they didn't even use that after about 1400 A.D.? King James didn't use that. They put that in there intentionally. It was 300 years old when they used it, or 200, whatever. And they did it because in English, we don't have a singular second person plural and a, plur uh, a second person and a plural second person. I just say you. That could mean all of you or that could mean you. But Greek makes a finer, it's a finer language. Well, English can do that. And the King James said we need to do that. Anytime it starts with a T, the, thou, it's singular. Anytime it's a ye, it's plural. They didn't do that to be antiquated. So when you take all of that out, because you're trying to be modern, you are diluting. Maybe it's not a big enough dilution to matter to you, but it, it helps me to know that ye, he was actually talking to the whole group, and I, if I had time, I could cite places where it does make a difference. And other times when he's saying thee, thee, Peter, ye, all of you apostles. So those distinctions are not just a matter of archaic words. Even where he said, we, we, we have bowels of compassion for you. I mean, that is about as modern translation as you can get. Bowels, the real translation of bowels is intestine. What he's saying is, I love you with my guts. I mean, you can't get more modern than that. I love your guts. Well, that's about as straight as you can get. So it's not behind at all. All right. Enough. Questions, answers, comments. Please keep them brief enough that we don't all just totally go nuts.
The New King James Version leaves out virtually all those scriptures I just gave you that's left out of the ESV and the NIV. The New King James Version leaves those out. So if that's what you want, and it has strong Alexandrian overtones in more than one place, in many places. So as for me, that's not what I want. I mean, in a, I, I, I'm not trying to diss anybody. I'm not trying to act like every scholar is an idiot. If they don't think that matters, then this is America. Thank God, it's a great place. You can live there if you want to. But, but this is the only Bible I got, and it's not very big, and it's the only thing from outer space, and it's the only thing that's the Word of God, and it's the only thing that's going to last longer than heaven or earth. Don't fool with it. I want it as clear as I can get it, and personally, I believe that the Antiochian Manuscripts gives us the clearest Bible that we can get. Somebody else. Brother, in the back. Thank you, sir. Somebody else. Good question. His question is, what about when uh, a translation uses the word Jehovah? And I think he would agree that an older translation would say, perhaps, Yahweh. But the King James says Jehovah, so could that be improved upon? Well, here's, here's the deal. The King James Version of the Bible is Old Testament, is taken from the Hebrew text. The Alexandrian manuscripts are taken primarily from what is called the Septuagint. They've never found the Septuagint, but it's a Greek copy. Uh, they just, they've got Greek copies, so they said somewhere there was an original one called Septuagint. Uh, it's taken from Greek copies, so it says different things, but uh, of the Old Testament. And they, they vary. The Septuagint varies from which the Alexandrian comes through. It varies from the Hebrew text. The Hebrew text uh, is called the Mesoretic Hebrew, as you may know. The Mesoretic Hebrew text uh, before 700 A.D. had no vowels. The original Hebrew language has no vowels, only consonants. And so the Tetragrammaton, the YHVH, or the YHWH, which is, we call Jehovah, if you take the vowels out, is Yahweh. If you put the vowels in, which the Jews are the one that put them in, in the 7th century AD, the Jews put vowels in it, so it would be easier to speak. If you put it in... Jehovah is Yahweh with two vowels. That's what it is. Jehovah is Yahweh with two vowels that were inserted in the 7th century Masoretic text. But it was still the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Old Testament, which came from all the way back. As far as they can trace it back is that it seems that around the time of Jesus there was actually a copy of the Hebrew Old Testament in the temple chained 
in the temple. And that was the, the document. So, um, the question of whether Yahweh is more appropriate than Jehovah depends upon whether you trust the Jews who originally wrote the Old Testament uh, to put vowels in their own language. So my conclusion would be that if you said Yahweh, it would be perfectly correct. Or if a version said Yahweh, it would be perfectly correct. Because it's saying the same thing except it's taking the vowels out that, that instead of Y-H-V-H, it's Y A H O V A H. So the the O, the A, the the A, the A, the O, the A are put in. Makes it Jehovah instead of Yahweh. Okay? So either way would be correct. Either way would be correct. According to the Jews, it'd be correct. Brother Booker. I, I would use them because I think some of them have good commentary. What I mean is, is there are times when words will have a shade of meaning. Every word in the Alexandrian is not different than every word in the Antiochian. There's just, there are differences, but not everything's different. Many, many things are not different. So there may be, the, and, and anybody here knows that if you give a word in, uh, there are words in English that may have ten shades of meaning. So the King James could not write out, the Amplified tried to do this, but that you cannot write out every meaning of that word and still have cohesive sentences. So you may look at three or four translations and they give you two things. One is a different slant on the meaning of word, and two is a particular interpretation, which is what a commentary does, which I don't think is, I think for study, that's fine. But to call something that is interpreting the Bible, to call that the Bible, I, you know, I, I, got, I just personally have a problem with it. The Bible's the Bible. And I want to tell you, there's not just a bunch of kooks that agree with where I'm at. Some of the finest scholars in the world, whom when I've read, and I haven't read all their books, I don't know a lot of stuff, but some of them I've read, so I've had to read some of their books. I, I read some of the lines in their books seven or eight times before I can even tell what they're saying. I'm telling you the truth. They are so, but, but you keep reading and you keep what? And when it finally dawns on you what they're saying, it's like, my God have mercy. I had no idea. And these men that I'm talking about agree with what I taught today. And they're respected throughout the world on the highest level, not just on this little group of fundamentalists or this little group of Pentecostals or this little, these are, these are highest respected scholars in the world in Biblical interpretation, translation, languages, text, literature, so forth. For the Booker? Well, what they've tried to do is make a difference between a translation and a paraphrase to excuse what they're doing. Literary people will tell you a paraphrase is a translation. It's just a really highly corrupted translation. So there is no such thing as a paraphrase. It's a guess that this is a paraphrase. It's like it's like I showed you on the on the deal with Mary hath chosen that good part. They're guessing that this is what that means. So you could say that's a paraphrase to what the original said. But it's not. It's a translation of it, and it's a corrupt translation. Or at least an incomplete or fragmented translation in the example that I used. So a paraphrase is another translation. It's just the, the more corrupted it gets, the more you have to soften, say, in translation. Because after a while, it's obvious that it's just somebody's attempt to be cool or whatever. Okay? Right. 
right. Yeah. Interestingly, on Isaiah 7.14, uh, I think you would find, for example, the ESV and maybe the new NIV going back to virgin. Because it, it, the ESV is an attempt to take the World Council of Churches version of the RSV and make it more palatable. This is why they did it to evangelicals, Pentecostals, hard-nosed Baptists, people who say, no, the Word of God's Word of God, don't fool with it. Okay? The, the ESV is an attempt to, to, to make that more palatable to us. So, if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the things that they changed. They went back and called Isaiah 714 virgin. So it's obvious. <laughs> It's obvious here that with the swing of the, the PR pro, I mean, if you can't sell a Bible to Pentecostals and Baptists, you just lost a big market. That's Bible people right there. And so this is my opinion, not trying to prove it, that marketing has driven many of these Bibles, money, many of these Bibles, and the printing of many of these Bibles. And, and, um, uh, the New King James Version, it was copyrighted. There's others that have been copyrighted, but it's copyrighted. They intended to make money with it. I don't think there's any doubt that they intended. But now it's swung back that the cell Bibles they need, so they went back to the original version. So things are getting better. Amplify I think it's fine. I think it's fine. It's, it's additional study material. All right. I think our chairman has gone home, brother. Okay. 1950 is when Eugene Nida or Nida, N-I-D-A, started translating into all these languages that didn't have enough words. And so he took Bible things and, and put it in different words. This is where dynamic equivalence became, ex it exploded. Then he decided we need to do that with the, with the English version. So why don't we believe we ought to do it with the English version when we agree that you got to do it with other languages? Because the English language is a long history. It has multitudes of words to express any idea of thought that human beings could have. It doesn't need that. When you do that, you actually limit the reader's exposure to the author instead of give them the author. Anybody else? All right. God bless you. Thank you for staying. <laughs> Brother Heyman. Second best? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. And I think that's kind of sad. He just wanted to know if is there any modernized Antiochian manuscript uh, versions of the Bible? And unfortunately, I don't know of any because they've all bought into Westcott and Hort's ideas, even though since then they've been proven to be less than reliable. It just means you've got to keep explaining to your kids. John Baptist, what? That's right. Russ Pell said that old song's right. John the Baptist used the King James Version. 